اسلام با خون رشد پیدا کرد پیغمبر بزرگ اسلام با یک دست قرآن را داشت و با دست دیگر شمشیر شمشیر برای سرکوبی خیانتکاران و قرآن برای هدایت اونها که قابل هدایت بودند قرآن راه نمای اونها بود اونهایی که هدایت نمی شدند و توتاگر بودند شمشیر بر سر اونها Since the 1979 Islamic Revolution, the Iranian government has staged tens of abductions, assassinations, and forced disappearances of regime critics in third countries. The Islamic Republic of Iran has always denied having a direct role in overseas killings. But the frequency of these incidents, the occasional remarks of officials in Tehran, and investigations by foreign security and law enforcement bodies make it clear. The Islamic Republic has been carrying out targeted terrorist acts abroad for more than four decades. In the first few months after the revolution, Iranian officials repeatedly and publicly stressed the need to eliminate their opponents, even those outside the country. Two days after he came to power, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ruhala Khomeini appointed Sadiq Halhali, a cleric and close member of his entourage, to be the head of the new revolutionary courts. The courts became the cornerstone of a campaign to wipe out all opponents of the regime. Executions were carried out across Iran, most infamously on the roof of the Refa School, a former girls' elementary school that became the first headquarters of Ayatollah Khomeini. The day after Halhole's appointment, Four high-ranking military officers in the previous government were executed on that rooftop in the middle of the night on the official charge of corruption on earth. Ever since then, and right up until the present day, eliminating dissidents has not only been seen by the Islamic Republic as a policy, but as a religious duty. Based on its own reading of the Muslim Holy Scripture, the Iranian regime claims that the punishment for whoever acts against it is death. In Habe Islam Aridan Adoran, in Haba Quran Mukhalifan, Agar as Quran, the Quran Etagad Doran, Quran Farmudas, Ati Allah, Ati or Rasul, Paul El Amrimenkum, Charazol El Am, Etat Namikonan, Charakiam Barzet the Hukumat Kardan. During Ayatollah Khomeini's reign, from 1979 to 1989, most of those killed and disappeared were supporters of the Pahlavi regime, allies of the former Shah of Iran, ex-military men, and members of opposition groups. In a court ruling in late 1979, Sadiq Khalkhali called disposed ruler Muhammad Reza Shah, his family and his ex-government officials all over the world, corruptors on earth, and sentenced them to death in absentia. The execution of the Shah is a serious business, and we mean it. We have sent a squad of three people to Mexico to carry out the execution either by shooting or by throwing up a grenade. Not long after the sentence was passed, Shariar Shafiq, the son of the Shah's sister, Ashraf Pahlavi, and a senior Iranian naval officer, was assassinated in Paris on December 7, 1979. Shafiq's surviving family are still searching for his killers four decades later. Seven months after Shafiq's murder, and also in Paris, Islamic Republic agents tried to assassinate Shapur Bakhtiar, the last prime minister under Pahlavi's regime. 
a French police officer and one of Mr. Bakhtahar's neighbors were killed in the attack. The prime suspect in that case was Anis al Nakash, a Lebanese guerrilla fighter who'd worked with Tehran to form Hezbollah in Lebanon. That assassination attempt caused controversy even inside Iran. The then foreign minister, Sadeh Gatsbazadeh, condemned the attack. He openly blamed it on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, a powerful military security institution created by Khomeini after the revolution. Gatsbazadeh's remarks were met with fury by the IRGC and Iran's extremist revolutionaries. Meanwhile, Anis al Nakash was arrested in France and later sentenced to life imprisonment. But six years later, in 1990, he was released in exchange for some French nationals taken hostage by Hezbollah in Lebanon. He then settled in Iran and set up a business. In an interview with Iranian State TV, al Nakash talked proudly about his role in negotiations over the French prisoner swap. In the same broadcast, Al Nakash criticized the constitution of Iran for not letting foreign nationals join the military. He called for a special unit to be set up, composed of non-Iranian citizens who supported the Islamic Republic. من از اول انقلاب هنوز قانون اساسی مطرح نشد برای رفرندوم بحث می‌کردی یه نقطه بود واجب نیروی های مسلح می‌گفته فقط و فقط ایرونیا عضو نیروی مسلح ایران من از اون زمان اعتراض کردم گفتم این انقلاب مال خودتون نیست من آینده باید وارد می‌کنم خیلی میلیون ها نفر می‌خواد از شما دفاع می‌کنه بالاخره نشد اینطوری متاسفانه من تا الان نتونستم این روحیه ایجاد میکنم به خاطر این انقلاب مال ایران فقط نیست. Anis Al Nakash died of COVID-19 in a hospital in Damascus, Syria on February 22nd, 2021. <laughs> Tehran's assassinations abroad continued in the decade after the revolution. On February 7, 1984, General Golam Ali Ovesi, the former commander of the Imperial Army's ground forces and an ex-military governor of Tehran, was shot and killed in Paris, along with his brother, Golam Hussein Ovesi. The Lebanese Islamic Jihad organization, led by Imad Mugnier, a student of Anis al Nakash claimed responsibility for the double murder. Mugnier also lived in Iran for many years and directed Hezbollah's global operations from there. The killings of survivors and ex officials of the Pahlavi regime carried on until the last days of Ayatollah Khomeini's life in 1989. But even after that, the policy held. Just hours after Khomeini's death, at the Ole Boy Akmadi, a former colonel in the Imperial Army and senior member of a monarchist group, was shot in the head by agents of the Islamic Republic at his hotel in Dubai. The Pahlavi family is still living in exile and still face regular death threats from the Iranian regime. Our next videos will examine some of the other terrorist operations carried out in the name of the Islamic Republic since 1979.